My name is Dr. Andrew Lloyd. I'm a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow at Aberystwyth University. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some of the research that we do in, in my research group and also uh, how our research fits into some of the wider research that goes on at Aberystwyth University. So the uh, theme for this year, for 2022, British Science Week is growth, uh, which is uh, quite fitting for a lot of the research that we do around plants and how they grow. Um, in my particular research group, we are interested in a, a specialised cell division that happens uh, in the reproductive structures of plants. It's a cell division called meiosis that gives rise to um, uh, pollen and egg cells and uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But first I'll give you a little bit of an overview of our institute. So this is IBAS just outside Aberystwyth in Mid Wales. At this uh, research institute there's a lot of plant breeding and plant science research that goes on and Aberystwyth has over 100 years of history of plant breeding. And that breeding focuses on, on a number of different crops. It includes oats, are a big one. Also quite a few forages. So we have uh, rye grass and clover. Well, you can see in this photo here, all the, the green hills of West Wales, uh, there's a lot of rye grass and clover growing around here. And also um, more recently uh, work on the bioenergy crop miscanthus. And so breeders at the university uh, spend quite a lot of their time generating new potential varieties um, but before they can go out to market, they need to be tested to see which uh, potential varieties have the specific traits that, uh, that we need. And so a lot of work gets, good, uh, gets put into assessing the uh, traits of those plants, or the phenotype of those plants, and so we call this phenotyping. And that happens in a number of different scales. So in our research group, we look quite often at single cells um, and look at what's going on even at the subcellular level. But there are researchers at the Institute looking at uh, individual plant structures. So this is a, a, a micro CT scan of a wheat spike. Uh, we also have the National Plant Phenomics Centre at Tanner Smith University and there we have a number of smart glass houses where we can run plants through and subject them to different treatments and see how they respond. And so we have a small system here where we can run smaller plants or seedlings through but we also have a larger system that we can run whole plants through like uh, oats or wheat or barley or things like that. And then, of course, we, have, uh, uh, we can grow these plants outside in the field and see how they respond in, in real-world conditions. So we had a little bit of a flyover of the Institute. Down there below, straight away, you can see one of the uh, experimental field uh, trial areas. And then we come and fly over the, uh, the research buildings. And uh, we're sort of nestled here in between the mountains and the sea on the, on, towards the west of, uh, uh, of Wales. If we pop down now inside one of these buildings, we can enter into the smart glass houses. And so you can see here uh, uh, an array of brassica plants that are, being, that are growing inside this facility. And we can hop on board one of these plants. So these, each plant is on its own individual, essentially train car that gets carried around on a conveyor belt system and it can automatically gets taken and gets watered. And, but also it gets taken through this series of imaging changes. There are a number of different imaging setups that uh, use different types of cameras to photograph these plants. And as you can imagine, when you've got a large population of plants that are, are growing for several months inside this facility, it generates a huge amount of image data. And so there are a number of uh, computer scientists and data scientists that work within the Phenomics uh, Centre to analyse that image data and extract inf interesting information from those images, like how plants are growing and how they're responding to different treatments that we might want to subject them to. If we pop back outside again, then we can see um, one of the uh, field trials. So this is an oat field trial that we're flying over here. And using drone imagery, uh, researchers are able to recreate 3D models of some of these uh, field trials. And then we can uh, extract useful information about how the plants are growing from these 3D models as well. But if we take a, a bit of a step back for a minute, humans have been interacting with plants and growing and cultivating plants for an extraordinarily long time. And as soon as plant, uh, humans started selecting plants that grew best and all particular plants that had the, the characteristics they want, indirectly they've been uh, altering the genomes of these plants. And so in a sense plant breeding has been going on for over 10,000 years. So on here we can see this is a, a spike of common wheat, so this is our, our standard wheat that, that gets grown. 
And you can see it, it has a, these, uh, a nice thick head where there's some nice big plump seeds inside there. On the left are the three different um, wild species from which wheat evolved. And so you can see these are much thinner, uh, much more grass-like structures with very much tinier seeds. Um, another big, I guess, innovation that came along with domestication of these crops was preventing the seed head shattering. So if you're a, a plant growing out in the wild, then you want to shatter your seeds uh, as, and spread them as far and as wide as you can so that you can uh, get your, your offspring growing in new places. But if you're uh, wanting to collect that seed, to harvest that to eat, then ideally you want all of that seed to remain intact in one spike sitting on the top of a wheat plant so you can come along and easily harvest it. So that was one innovation. There are other innovations to do with the structure of the, the, um, the wheat spike itself, which made it easier to extract the grain from, from the rest of that uh, plant material. Uh, another thing that's changed a lot in particularly the last hundred years of uh, more, uh, a more scientific approach to plant breeding is plant height. So this is an example from wheat and we can see varieties that were released from 1910 through to 2010. And you can see that during that time uh, wheat uh, varieties have had a, a huge reduction in size. And so the vast majority of wheat that is now grown are these dwarf varieties. And there's a number of reasons for this but they tend to be, the shorter plants tend to be a bit stockier and stouter in stature and so they don't get blown over as much by the wind, and so the, we call that lodging. Uh, and because of that, we, have, we can get better yields for them, particularly in, in windy environments. And also because they're putting less energy into growing really big stems and really big leaves, then there's more energy to vote to um, uh, putting into those grains, and so we can get bigger yields as well. So plant breeding has continued to um, improve our crops and imp improve the amount of crops that we can grow. Uh, if you look at this graph here, this is showing us the amount of um, grain that can be produced from, the, from a set area of land. And from the 60s through to the, to the mid-90s, we saw there was continual uh, increases in the amount of uh, yield that we're able to, or the amount of food that we can produce from the same area of land. And there were a number of reasons, this for, but one of the big ones is plant breeding, uh, which has improved the, the yield that we're able to achieve. But since the mid-90s, these yield gains have, have slowed down, and you can see that uh, essentially plateaued, and in some cases possibly even fallen away. And one of the uh, big reasons for this is a change in climate. And so plants that were well adapted for conditions um, of 20 years ago are not so well adapted for the conditions of today. And so we have uh, increasing global temperatures, we also have increasing uh, variability in our weather. Along with these changes in the environment comes changes in disease pressure. So we have new diseases that are coming in all the time for which our crops are, are not particularly well prepared. And at the same time, if we want to grow enough food sustainably, we also want to be thinking about the wider ecosystem. And for that reason, we want to be limiting the amount of chemical inputs that are going into the fields. So we want to be reducing things like pesticides and herbicides. So all of this presents challenges for growing crops. And one of the big problems with crops is that they lack diversity. So if you look at a wild population of wheat, for this example, uh, individuals are really variable and there are a lot of traits that vary between each individual. And because of this diversity and this variability, within that population there's um, resistance to a wide array of different diseases and lots of different stresses that that population might encounter. And also because of that diversity it makes these populations quite adaptable because there's a lot of uh, potential traits out there that can be drawn on in natural selection. In contrast, our cultivated crops are more or less cloned. And on the one hand this is fantastic because it means all of those plants come to peak ripeness at exactly the same time. All of the seed heads are at exactly the same height, so it's easy to harvest with our harvester. All of the grain is always of the same quality year in, year out, which means bakers know exactly how uh, their dough is going to respond when it goes into the oven. But there are downsides as well, and one of those downsides is that because they lack diversity, they have uh, resistance to a smaller set of diseases, and they're also able to cope with a smaller array of different environmental stresses. This lack of diver diversity means that they're essentially set in stone and they are unable to adapt to well to new conditions. And so part of the role of plant breeding is to introduce new variation back into our cultivated varieties. 
So there are some uh, new ways that are uh, potentially coming online that are just beginning to be looked at in terms of how we could add new variation. And one of these is looking at gene editing through new technologies like CRISPR-Cas9. But today I'd like to talk to you about a, a more traditional cloud breeding approach, which is to go back to these wider populations and see if we can reintroduce some of the traits that are already out there in these wild populations. So this is a, a map showing us where the um, biodiversity of wild wheats is located. And you can see by this red mark here that the real um, biodiverse area is in the Middle East. And so as you can imagine, there's a lot of wild wheats out there that are well adapted to growing in hot and dry conditions. There are also, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of disease resistance traits in these wild um, populations. So this is an, um, an example showing, so here on the left is a leaf from a wild wheat and it's been inoculated with a certain path pathogen and, but this wild wheat is resistant to that pathogen. In contrast, the next three leaves are of a cultivated wheat variety and you can see that they're definitely not resistant and so you can see the disease spreading all over these leaves. Then the last three leaves are cultivated wheats, so things that would be grown commercially, but the resistance trait from the wild wheat, wheat has been added in to these cultivated varieties. And so now uh, this cultivated variety is resistant to this particular pathogen. So this is the approach that we'd like to be able to use, and as a result we can see that these uh, wild relatives of crops and uh, also something we term land races are really important because they're a fantastic resource of, of potential new traits that we could add to our breeding. And so because of that, for decades now, researchers across the globe have been really looking to safeguard the diversity of the world's crops and crop relatives. And so one of the places that these uh, seeds are stored uh, is in the Svalbard seed vault. So this is up in the Arctic Circle and it's a seed vault that holds millions and millions of samples of different seeds that have been collected from populations all around the world. And it includes cultivated varieties, but it also includes all of the relatives of the crops that we know of. And so this is a, a really fantastic resource that breeders or scientists can go back to and request seeds from. So we don't have anything quite that Im impressive in Aberystwyth, but we do have a fantastic seed store as part of our uh, new Aber Innovation Campus. And so we have, uh, as part of this uh, new building here, we've uh, reinvigorated our seed store and we have now over 30,000 seed samples of seeds that have been collected uh, over the course of more than 100 years from all around the world and also that have, been, that have come out of breeding programs run at Aberystwyth for over 100 years. And so there's a fantastic resource here, particularly focused on the crops and relatives of crops that we work with in the Institute. So what then is the next step after you've um, identified potentially a wild parent that has a new, new trait that you'd like to introduce uh, into your crop. Well, the first step is to cross these two different plants together. And so to do that, we take some pollen from one parent and use that to fertilize the flowers of another parent. And so you can see a, a very old image here of um, some crossing of ryegrass that's going on in the Institute, but it happens essentially exactly the same way today. So each of our parents, um, like most organisms, has two copies of each of its chromosomes. So parent one has two copies of each chromosome, and parent two has two copies of each chromosome. And these chromosomes are, are the big structures into which all our DNA is, is packaged inside the cell. And so when we generate the, the next generation from these two parents, the offspring, then parent one will um, donate one copy of each of its chromosomes to the, uh, to the hybrid, and parent two will donate one copy of each of its chromosomes to the hybrid. And so we refer to the, uh, the offspring of these two individuals as uh, an F1 hybrid. And so the F1 hybrid displays quite often a, an intermediate set of um, traits between a sort of mix of the traits of parent one and parent two. But importantly, what happens in uh, the F1 hybrid in the reproductive structures, in the flowers, is a process called meiotic recombination. And so in meiotic recombination, segments of the chromosomes from parent one and parent two get swapped around inside the F1 hybrid to generate a new chromosome. And we've got that over here on the right. And this new chromosome has some sequence that came from parent one and some sequences that came, sorry, parent two and some sequences that came from, from parent one. And so this is an entirely new chromosome that has a new set of traits on it. 
And so it's this process of myelodical combination that really generates the new combinations of traits that we see in our plants. So in, um, in all sexually reproducing uh, organisms, there's two main types of cell division, mitosis and meiosis. So mitosis is the one that's important for vegetative growth, and that's going to grow us new roots and shoots and leaves. And in that, each cell undergoes uh, one round of DNA replication, and then one round of cell division. And so at the end of mitosis, you end up with two cells, and each of those two cells are an exact copy of the cell that went into mitosis. But the cell division I spoke about um, just before, meiosis, is this specialised cell division that only occurs inside the reproductive structures and gives rise to pollen and egg cells. And so in uh, meiosis, we start with uh, a cell that undergoes, again, one round of DNA replication. But this time it has two rounds of cell division. So we have the first uh, round of uh, cell division where we separate homologous chromosomes into the different um, daughter cells. And then the second round of cell division where the sister chromosome tits of each of those chromosomes get separated into two daughter cells. So at the end of meiosis we now have four cells and each of those cells is genetic genetically unique, so it has a, a, a sequence that, not, that has never been seen before, and it only has one copy of each chromosome, so it has half the amount of DNA that was present in the original cell that went into meiosis. And the reason all of these uh, cells are unique is because of this process of recombination that takes place, where segments of chromosomes get swapped. And that process of recombination occurs quite early on in meiosis 1. We study uh, meiosis and mitotic recombination in our lab, and so to do that we spend quite a lot of time at the microscope staring down at uh, cells that are undergoing meiosis. And we can see some cells here, so these are in white you can see the DNA. And at the beginning of meiosis, when the chromosomes are just beginning to condense, we can see these thin strands of, uh, that represent the individual chromosomes. And at the beginning it looks just like a big jumble of spaghetti all, all mixed together, but as meiosis progresses, uh, homologous chromosomes find each other and pair up along their entire length. And then those pairs of chromosomes begin to condense and get more and more tightly packed until we form these structures that we call bivalence here. This is a, coming into metaphase one in meiosis. And so this a particular plant that we're looking at here has um, 13 pairs of chromosomes. Each of these white shapes uh, represents one pair of chromosomes. And then uh, in, in anaphase, in the next step of meiosis, these uh, pairs of chromosomes separate out to the uh, two different daughter cells. And then, so that's the first meiotic division, and we undergo the second meiotic division where the cystic chromatids uh, separate to, um, to new daughter cells. And so at the end of meiosis, we now have four cells. And uh, so now each of these cells will go on to produce, in this case, a, a new pollen grain. We can also uh, track the location of specific proteins of interest in, uh, in these cells. So this is, again, a cell going through meiosis. And we can uh, look at, we're looking at two different proteins here. One marked in green uh, is one of the first proteins that loads onto the chromosomes at the beginning of meiosis. And you can see, again, these uh, long, thin lines of all mixed together of the different chromosomes. But then there's a second protein that we've marked in pink here, which uh, uh, is found where pairs of homologous chromosomes are pairing up along their length. So you can see as meiosis 1 progresses, we get more and more of the chromosomes are, are becoming completely paired along their entire length. So we can do, build a sort of 3D reconstruction of one of these cells. And so in blue, here's the DNA, and we take that away, and then we can see um, more clearly now the individual chromosomes that are joined in pink. And then there's one pair of chromosomes that still hasn't completely joined yet, so we still see some green there. Okay, so we've... Uh, We've got our parent one, we've got our parent two, we've got pollen uh, from one to fertilize the other to make our F1 hybrid. And in that one F1 hybrid, there's recombination taking place, which is swapping segments of uh, chromosomes to generate entirely new chromosomes that have new combinations of sequence. And depending on which segments of chromosomes come from parent one and which segments of the chromosome come from parent two, this will mean we get different combinations of traits in, in the offspring of this F1 hybrid. So what I'm showing you here is just uh, a representation of what's happening for one chromosome, but of course this is happening for, for every chromosome in the, in the genome of that plant. 
And so from the progeny of the, the hybrid here, then we can generate uh, families that are potential new varieties. And so the next step then is to grow these potential new varieties out in the field and assess how they, uh, how they respond and, and how well they grow and, and what the quality of their grain is. And so if we pop back outside again now, we can see a field that is of oats that is now at its time to harvest, so all the seed is ready. And you can see the individual rectangular blocks where these different um, potential new varieties are being grown. And so this uh, small little harvester is um, designed so that it can harvest and keep individual the seed from each of these separate experimental plots. And then uh, once all that seed has been collected, then it can, uh, will be taken back and the breeders will uh, assess how much uh, grain each of these plots produced, what is the quality of the grain, and decide which of these potential new varieties will then be taken on uh, to the next step and, and be uh, bulked up so that we've got enough seed to um, uh, send out to market and for it to be grown by farmers across the UK. So that sort of brings us more or less to the end of my talk. So I'll leave you with a couple of take home messages. So the first is that for sustainable agriculture going forward, we need to breed, breed new varieties that are adapted not to conditions now, but to the future conditions that we might be meeting in 10 or so years time. And so we need to be able to ensure high yield quality and resilience of our crops in a time when we're having environmental change and needing to reduce our chemical inputs. So to breed new varieties, that is done by assembling combinations of traits from two or more parents. And so these could be two different varieties or land races or wild crop relatives. And this diversity of crops and crop relatives is a really important source of new potential traits. And at the cellular level, it's meiotic recombination that combines DNA sequences from two different parents to generate new and unique chromosomes that have new combinations of traits. And with that, I would like to say thank you for listening. Um, if you're interested in any more of um, my research or that of the wider institute, then do follow the, the website there. Well, goodbye, thank you for listening, and I hope you had a good time.